This conference will now be recorded. I've been very much looking forward to tonight's program, Howell Farm, Its History and Heritage, which is co-sponsored with the Mercer County Park Commission. Uh, I wanna thank Kevin and Pete Watson for all of their help with putting this program together. And I also wanna thank um, the Hopewell Valley Historical Society for their help in getting the word out about this evening's program. I truly value um, the relationship that we have with the Hopewell uh, Valley Historical Society. So I do appreciate all your efforts as well. Um, tonight's presenter, Larry Hitter, is a retired high school history teacher who taught for 40 years in both public and private schools, including 32 years at the Hun, Hun School of Princeton. His current research interests fall into two main areas, the history of the Pleasant Valley area in Northwest Hopewell Township, New Jersey, as well, and his second is topics relating to the American Revolution, uh, to American Revolution history of what is today Mercer County, New Jersey. He's published numerous articles and books such as 10 Crucial Days, Washington's Victory for for Washington's vision for victory unfolds, as well as Farming Pleasant Valley, 250 years of life in rural township, rural Hopewell Township, New Jersey. For close to 33 years, is that right, Larry? 33 years? You've yep. <laughs> he has volunteered at the Howell Living History Farm, which is part of the Mercer County Park System. He has served as uh, a historian for them, an interpreter, and draft horse teamster. His desire to research our local history is truly a gift to all of us. And without further ado, Larry, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Anna. I'm very glad to be with you all tonight and to tell you the story of a place that I hold very dear to my heart, as you can imagine. Um, I think that very important to recognize that as a uh, park of the Mercer County Park Commission and as a, uh, a farm, it's a, it's a very unusual situation. Uh, many living history farms don't have the facilities to do a, a full farming program, but Howell Farm does. And part of that is um, because it's always been a farm. Mercer County did not have to take a property and develop a farm on it to be a living history farm. Uh, the farm that they got was just full of history. And, uh, you know, 250 years uh, that that land has been farmed and it's never, never been out of farming uh, for, for any period of time. So the, uh, when, when the Mercer County got the property and develop the park uh, at the request of the person who donated the property to the farm, uh, Inez Howell, uh, she wanted it to be around the turn of the century, uh, the 20th century. And so that's what Howell Farm focuses on, a period of about 1890 to 1910. However, they don't stop at that. They also preserve and study those 250 years of change in agricultural life and, uh, and farming. So the farm is really a time capsule of New Jersey history and contains structures um, and other elements above ground that are remnants of its long history and other elements that have gone by the wayside over those 215 years uh, have left evidence, even if it's not above ground, it's underground. And so there's been a lot of archeological work that's been done. Now, the farm itself goes back, you know, like I say, about 250 years. And just to put it in the perspective of New Jersey's early history, you know that at one point, uh, New Jersey was two colonies, uh, proprietary colonies of East and West Jersey. And they were divided by a province line. And those of you that know province line road, that's the approximate area of where that, that line was that divided East and West Jersey. So what became Howell Farm was in West Jersey. And the two sections uh, combined in 1702 as the Royal Colony of New Jersey. 
but still people thought of East and West Jersey as somewhat different uh, in culture and in uh, way of life even. Now today, just to give you a, a real good idea of where the farm is, uh, the uh, map from uh, you know online maps today shows the, the main roads, uh, Valley Road, Pleasant Valley Road, Woodens Lane, and just to put that into context, um, you have Route 29 going up the Delaware River. There's the stone quarry at the uh, end, end of Pleasant Valley Road and Bald Pate Mountain, which most people know. And that's how a living history farm, basically. Uh, the map that I superimposed on it is um, a map of how the different crop fields were used at one point. It's not necessarily how they are today, but it, it changes periodically because of the crop rotations. But you can see that it's a, it's a good sized uh, piece of property. And also Mercer County has uh, added properties to it, has purchased properties in addition to what was donated originally. And some of those areas uh, are now incorporated into the, the workings of the farm. And we'll see that as we go along. Before European settlement, obviously, the area was occupied by Native Americans. And then when the British uh, start their colonial system, uh, the land that's now Howell Farm came into the hands of Dr. Daniel Cox in the late 1680s. He never get, came here. He, was, he stayed in England. He was physician to the English royal court, a very high-ranked man. Uh, but he had his agent uh, in uh, West Jersey on March 30th, 1688, purchase uh, a vast tract of land. Even it says modern Hopewell Township, but it was even more than that. And it was a group of 11 Native Americans. Uh, I mentioned this, you know, reminding everyone that all of the dealings with uh, Native Americans were not always really uh, done properly and whatnot. And uh, unfortunately, we fall into that, that whole thing. Uh, before 1737, Daniel Cox, the son of the doctor, uh, did come to uh, West Jersey and established a 507 acre farm called Belmont Farm at the mouth of Moore's Creek, which um, was at, at Pleasant Valley Road and Route 29. He actually established another farm just north of that and the old stone barn at the end of Valley uh, Road at Route 29 is, is dates back to the 18th century there. Now, Joseph Phillips was a house carpenter in Maidenhead, or now today's Lawrence Township. And in 1733, he purchased 125 acres uh, from the uh, land that uh, Daniel Cox controlled in what is now uh, Pleasant Valley. He owned that land for a couple of years and he sold it to his brother, John Phillips. And John Phillips may have already been living there. In other words, when Joseph Phillips purchased the land, he didn't move to it. He stayed in Maidenhead, and it's very likely that his brother lived there and then purchased it from him in 1737. And that property was the core of the present day Howell Living History Farm. Uh, but the land has been added to. It was initially added to by John Phillips himself and then by his descendants uh, who had adjoining farms in the area. And it got to be quite a, a Phillips neighborhood. Now to show you the significance of the site where John Phillips established his farm in the 1700s, or excuse me, yeah, in the 1700s, uh, this map from the 1770s shows the area as it was then. I put a couple of uh, labels on it, uh, where Trenton is, where Coriel's Ferry, or now today's Lambertville is. Uh, also, you see Maidenhead underlined, Pennington, uh, Princeton, and where it's the Baptist meeting up at the top uh, central part of the map, that's Hopewell Borough today. Uh, and I think any of you, if you know Hopewell Borough, you know that Baptist meeting house, the old brick 
uh, meeting house there. So you get an idea of just where it's located. Now, if you're gonna be traveling from Trenton to Lambertville, known as Georgetown back then, which was a frequent uh, passage, the road is going to go right by John Smith's farm and farmhouse. And that's gonna be very important as to how things develop. Now, looking at the map again of basic uh, area of Howell Farm, uh, you notice that Pleasant Valley Road, if you go to the right, eventually wound up in Trenton. But if you turned up Valley Road at the intersection, it would be the road to Lambertville. So he's right at the, the corner of the road there. The Pleasant Valley Road that continues on to the south as went to that uh, farm of Daniel Cox, the, the Belmont farm that we talked about earlier. So John Phillips builds his house right on this main road and you know, he's, he's got a good sized family. Now, the house that I'm showing you here is not the house that he built. Uh, if you know how farm, you know that that's a uh, former schoolhouse and a former home of a poultry farmer. Uh, but I put that picture there because the picture was taken from about the spot where John Phillips' house was. Uh, it's no longer standing there. It, it's, it was actually the playground of that school uh, covered over the, the foundations of the John Phillips house. So we did some archeology span there several years ago uh, with Hunter Research and found some foundations uh, for the John Phillips house. Uh, this is just one of the excavation uh, pits that was done. And I like that one because very nicely, two of the artifacts that came out of it were two coins. And to identify and make sure that this uh, site was the, the site of the house, you needed to date it. The top coins were British coins from the 1690s to early 1700s. And it was a type of coin we found out that got used into several decades of the uh, 18th century. So it's very possible that they would have been used by the Phillipses in their very early years at the house in 1737. The other coin was a, uh, an American coin, a US coin, a half penny of a type that existed until about the 1850s. And that's about the last we know that the house was standing. So we found archeologically these two coins that pretty much dated this foundation as pretty definitely the John Phillips house and represented its, its entire occupancy. I find that very interesting because these coins were found in the same pit and virtually about a foot uh, apart above and you know, in vertically from each other. Now, in addition to John Phillips, uh, who was a blacksmith, he also had a son who was a blacksmith named Lot Phillips. And we know that they had a blacksmith shop somewhere on their property. And we think it was probably right here on Valley Road, where you see a house and a garage. The garage is on the site of a blacksmith shop, which we found by doing archeological work there. Uh, these are some of my, my students who were able to come out and help Hunter research to um, investigate the area on one, one day and found definite evidence of the blacksmith house and even of its foundation underneath and um, with one wall right next to where the, the current garage is. So there's, we don't know how old that blacksmith shop is, but it was definitely there. And so it's been identified. We also know that John Phillips had a son named Henry who was a miller and who set up a grist mill. And we knew from maps about where this was. And we also could look at the ground uh, just to the uh, south side of Pleasant Valley Road and could see the indentations in the earth where the mill pond was and where the head race was and that sort of thing and the, and the, the dam for that matter. And so we were able to identify where that was. We believe that the grist mill looked like this one, which was built at the same time, and probably by the same millsmith 
in uh, in Hunterdon County. And when we dug, we found the foundation, which would have been exactly for that building. We found the, the wheel pit in just the right place. We found where the head race uh, would have emptied into it to drive the wheel around. And we found various corners and walls uh, to create the uh, uh, rectangle uh, foundation of that grist mill. So very clearly, they had a grist mill. Now, the farming methods at the time were very much um, in need of the facilities of a miller and of a blacksmith. The farming was uh, a lot of different crops and different animals, some of which were used by the farmers themselves and some of which were crops to sell to make a profit. The most profitable crop to sell was wheat. Uh, New Jersey as a middle colony was part of the breadbasket of the British Empire and wheat was, was grown in large quantities in this area. And the power for growing the wheat was primarily animal power, the oxen, uh, sometimes horses, but predominantly oxen in the early years. And the oxen only did part of it though. They only did the breaking of the ground and beginning to get the ground ready for planting. It was human labor then that did the planting and did the care of the crop. And then finally, as you see on the right-hand side, did the uh, you know, uh, reaping of the crop and with a scythe and a sickle and that sort of thing. So it was a very much um, human power oriented farm system. Uh, the oxen did the most heaviest work, but humans did a lot of uh, exhausting work too. Now, while they were living in Pleasant Valley in the area of Howell Farm, uh, the Phillips family served in the militia during the revolution. Henry Phillips, the owner of the grist mill was a captain in the Hunterdon County Militia, and then a major later in the war. Be partly because of his service in the war, uh, what was the John Phillips farm at that time, uh, came under British plundering. December of 1776, think about what was happening. Uh, Washington had crossed New Jersey after some defeats in the New York campaign. He had crossed his army over to Pennsylvania uh, in the first week of December, and the British wanted to follow him. But Washington very smartly had uh, made sure that everything that floated, any kind of a boat that could be used, was taken over to Pennsylvania with him all, all up and down the river, and the British couldn't follow him. Well, in order to try to find boats, the British looked along the shore, and one of the places that General Cornwallis sent some of his troops to find boats he was in uh, Pennington at the time. He sent troops over to the Lambertville area and they went on that main road right by the John Phillips farm on their way to the river to look for boats. When they couldn't find any boats, they returned to uh, Pennington and they came again right by the farmhouse. They weren't in a very good mood because they uh, hadn't found boats and they kind of took it out on some of the farmers, including John Phillips. John Phillips was getting up into his 80s at this point, and you know the militia members of his family weren't home, but he was, and the women folk and all, and the British pretty much plundered his farm and beat him up uh, physically. Uh, he survived, but uh, the, the farm was really badly damaged by the British. So how far actually, you know, played a small role in the, in the American Revolution there. At the same time during the Revolution, I mentioned Lot Phillips, the uh, uh, blacksmith uh, who uh, was his father, John Phillips' son. He had an indentured servant or um, named Thomas Case, who was mixed race, what they called back then as a mulatto, but he was a, he was a free uh, black person, essentially. And while he was indentured to Lot Phillips, there went out a call to the militia to supply men for the Continental Army. And 
they divided the militiamen into small groups and each group had to supply one man to the Continental Army. And apparently Thomas Case was supplied by Lot Phillips for the Continental Army as his uh, substitute in a sense. And so Thomas Case wound up serving for about nine months in the Continental Army, which is what they were uh, raising the men for just that nine months. Uh, Thomas Case later got his independence uh, when he reached the end of his indenture and got his uh, got clothing and uh, freedom gifts from uh, Lot uh, Phillips. We also have the story of slavery at this time because Henry Phillips, who owned the grist mill, also owned a male slave who may have operated that mill, particularly when Henry Phillips was away on militia duty, which he was very frequently. And we also know that at the time of his death, um, he had a young girl who lived with him. We don't know her name for sure, but because of some later things, we believe it, it might have been Nance, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But in his will, it's only the, the Negro girl who's mentioned and the Negro girl's bed. Uh, but that's uh, enough for us to know that he had an enslaved woman as well as an enslaved man. Now, it, around 1780, during the American Revolution, uh, there's a couple of deaths in the Phillips family. John Phillips' wife passes away, and their son Lot uh, passes away also. Uh, I, it wasn't a, a war injury, it was some kind of an illness, I believe. But they started a family cemetery uh, right about 1780. And that cemetery today is still partly visible. And it's, as you see in the picture here, uh, practically right next to the old schoolhouse. And while most of the headstones have uh, been broken or removed or are no longer readable, uh, there's this one headstone that is almost readable. I won't say it's readable. Uh, you can read the in at the very top, but after that, it becomes a little tough. You can tell it's basically a Phillips, but that's about it. Uh, some uh, Ground penetrating radar work that was done around that cemetery uh, indicated that there might be as many as 90 people buried in this cemetery, but it only was used from the uh, 1780s until the very early, very early 1800s. And so it probably became a community cemetery as well as a family cemetery. Now in the late 18th century, uh, the Phillips family also improved their power source for their mill. Uh, they completely reworked the, um, the uh, mill pond, made it a larger, and the dam and the whole uh, way of getting water to the mill was improved. They also built a second house uh, somewhere in the 1780s or 90s, uh, which is now today a, a part of Howell Farm also. And you see the picture at the top around 1900 and then the bottom picture, the picture of the house today. It went through uh, several owners. Uh, we don't know if it was built while John Phillips was still alive or whether it was built by his son Henry, but it's important to know that John Phillips had four sons who each set up their own farms. One took over his farm obviously and then there were three others. And so this is an extension of the Phillips property an example of the extension of it. In the early 19th century, just after 1800, Henry Phillips has a son named Henry. We're now at the third generation of the Phillips family. So this is a, the grandson of John Phillips named Henry. And he builds the first section of his farmhouse, which is the stone part of today's uh, Howell Farm farmhouse. It was a two-story, one room on each floor building, and he's going to raise about six kids there, or at least start out raising six kids there. We believe at the time also he built a barn, which no longer exists, but underneath the current barn, for those of you that know it, uh, there appears to be a part of a foundation that could have been an earlier barn, uh, some kind of farm building anyway, and so we 
we think he had that early on. So he's starting his farmstead here that's going to eventually be the farmstead that we think of as the main part of Howell Farm today. Henry Phillips also uh, believed in education and he established the first schoolhouse in the area sometime in the 1820s probably uh, as his kids were getting old enough to go to school. Uh, we believe that he wanted to establish this school, not just for the community in general, but specifically for his kids and probably the kids of the other Phillips uh, siblings that lived in the area. It became known as the Phillips Mill School because it was so close to the mill. So we know about it uh, from an 1826 uh, map that was made to indicate uh, an improvements to a road. And you can see that the schoolhouse is labeled there and also the grist mill just to the right of it. And you're following from the grist mill to the schoolhouse, you're following Pleasant Valley Road. And if you keep going to the right on that, you see it says Trenton Road. So that's the that main road to Trenton we talked about before. And then if you turn the corner there, go across the bridge at uh, what was then Smith's Creek and then you go to Lambertville. So everything is in, in set here and we, we know that school was there at least by 1826. In the early 1820s, we also know that the story of slavery continues at what is now Howell Farm. New Jersey passed a gradual abolition act in 1804, which basically said any slave uh, born, between, born before July 4th, 1804, would remain a slave for life, no chance of freedom. However, any slave born after July 4th, 1804, if it was a girl, she would become free of slavery at age 21. If it was a boy, he would become free of slavery at age 25. So that gradual abolition act really didn't free anybody, but it uh, established freedom, eventual freedom for at least some people. We know about this in relation to the slave woman I mentioned before named Nance, because after 1804, slave owners had to record with the county clerk the birthdays of children born to their slave women. They had to include the name of the slave woman, they had to include the name of the owner, the name of the child, and the date of birth of the child never had to mention who the father was. So we don't know who Nance's children's father was, but we do know about six or so children that she had in the early 1800s. And they were, you know, eventually freed. However, Nance obviously was born before 1804. And so she remained a slave for life. So this is you know, going on all through uh, Pleasant Valley in New Jersey at this time. And we have this one example uh, from Howell Farm. Now, by the, moving into the next couple of decades, the 1830s and 40s, we begin to see some improvements. We see that uh, Henry Phillips, as he's uh, getting on in years and developing the farm, is making improvements to it. And one of the improvements uh, in the late 1830s, 1840s, was to create the first two sections of the current barn that we know at Howell Farm. And we believe that it replaced that earlier structure that we talked about. Uh, we know it was an L-shaped barn uh, and that it accommodated both crops and animals. And, you know, it's still there today, those two sections, but it's been added too. Uh, we also know that around the 1830s, uh, Henry Phillips expanded his house. Uh, he added the hall and uh, a frame addition in that time period. And I would say to anybody that has seen the house, the hall and the first floor of that frame addition uh, are a marked uh, upgrade from the uh, structure of the original stone house. The uh, door frames, the window frames, the uh, 
decoration of the, the walls, that kind of thing, showed that Henry Phillips was moving up in the world. And you know, the hall is basically a, uh, a place of greeting. It's, a, it, it's a, a place to show status more than to do an actual work in and that sort of thing. So Henry's coming up in the world. And that house then looked like this picture. I know the trees are in front of it, but if you know the house today, it dates back to about the 1830s, that, uh, that view of it, that uh, way of, of construction. About the same time, about these same decades, uh, Henry Phillips had a son who achieved adulthood named Lewis, and he gave Lewis two acres uh, for his own house and also that included the blacksmith shop because Lewis was a blacksmith. So those couple of acres are going to get separated from Henry's farm eventually, uh, basically with his, um, his will. And it's going to become the home of a blacksmith for several generations. Now, notice that what we have here at the two Phillips houses, the schoolhouse, and the Phillips blacksmith shop, this is almost the beginning of a little crossroads community, a little um, economic center as well as a community. And there was hope, I think, that the Phillips had that it would, because it was on a main road, that it would bring a lot of economic activity to them. And they could take advantage of the people who traveled through. However, uh, that's not going to happen. And possibly a, a good reason for that is the main, route, uh, the main route between Trenton and Lambertville changed from Pleasant Valley Valley Road to first the canal, and then a decade later or so, the railroad, which ran up the river. And so people bypassed the Phillips area and so it never developed beyond basically what the, the Phillipses had there. That doesn't mean that the uh, grist mill and the blacksmith shop aren't gonna be useful and, and, and economically successful, they are. It's just gonna mean that not a lot of other stuff moves in to, to join them. Now in the 1860 map of this part of Hopewell Township, you can see the railroad where it says Belvedere and then the black line above it is the canal. And now what I just highlighted for you is uh, the name of the owner when this map was made of what's today Howell Farm. That was just a transition point between Henry Phillips and Charles Miller, uh, who is gonna show up uh, very shortly here. So we see the, the Phillips family basically fading out here. You see to the left center, T.Q. Phillips, Tunis Quick Phillips. He is related to the Phillips family, but he's moved out of the original family area to another part of uh, the Pleasant Valley area. In addition to uh, Drake now owning the Howell Farm area, Notice that the blacksmith shop still exists, but now it's uh, Stuart, who was the son-in-law of Lewis Phillips, the original owner there. And they just take up residence um, along with Lewis until uh, the passing of that generation, and then they stay. And now notice that the grist mill is only marked as a mill uh, owned by Brewer. And at this point, we believe that this is the, the tail end of the mill activity, and it's maybe not even operating anymore. There may be a mill structure there and Brewer owns the land around it, uh, but it may not be a functioning mill anymore. Notice the schoolhouse is still there and functioning. And now we know that Charles Miller develops uh, his um, residency and ownership of the farm about 1860. And he's gonna make changes in 1865 that are quite substantial to the house. He's gonna add that North addition. And that's really a building 
that was moved and attack and set up next to the house. I, I don't even want to use the word attached. It, it's just right next to the house. And we know that that was done in 1865 because uh, when that window was um, covered over, when the building was added to it, the window was filled in and made part of the wall, the interior wall. And before they did that, they put some, uh, uh, some cement in there and wrote a message about who did the moving, what day they did it, and a little poem about uh, looking to the future and that sort of thing. So the Millers uh, you know, added that to it. They're living at this farm at exactly an interesting time when horsepower is increasing and manpower is decreasing. Uh, you notice a lot of different pieces of equipment that are used by horses so that the animals uh, like before in the, in the 1700s were just plowing. Now the horses are doing everything from plowing to harvesting and it's not taking hardly any uh, human labor anymore. And this of course is happening at the same time the industrial revolution is going. So jobs are moving from the farms to the uh, cities and, and wherever factories are. By the end of the century, uh, even steam power is coming into play. Now, by 1875, Charles Miller definitely is on the map now as owning. Sherman now owns the blacksmith shop. He purchased it from Stewart. The schoolhouse is still there, but now there's no more John Phillips house and no more mill on the map. Both of those structures have disappeared. So we're definitely moving away from the, the Phillips uh, aspect of things and, and looking at uh, new families uh, living in the area and, and taking charge of things. In 1889, Charles Miller and other farmers on um, Hunter Road asked the county to build a bridge across Morris Creek to make it easier uh, for them to travel and have access to their farms. And that iron bridge was built uh, during the summer of 1889. The, the freeholders agreed to do that after coming out to visit. Also in the summer of 1889, another change took place when the schoolhouse that had been built by uh, Henry Phillips in, in the 1820s was no longer functional and it was dismantled and a brand new schoolhouse was built uh, right next to the Phillips family cemetery and right next to where the original uh, John Phillips house had been. And you see two pictures here of that schoolhouse and the picture on the right hand side, that cart and horse there on Pleasant Valley Road uh, headed towards the intersection with Valley. And in the picture in the upper left corner, you see not only the schoolhouse and the kids and the teacher, but you see uh, just to the back left, you see the horse sheds. Uh, and then just to the left of that, you can make out sort of the roof of the outhouses. Uh, there were horse sheds here at the schoolhouse, not because the kids took horses to school, but because the schoolhouse was also a community center for the entire uh, valley and was used as a church. Uh, ministers would come up from Titusville to hold services there and town meetings would be held there, all of that. So the shed was for the horses of families that came to either worship uh, there or to come to a meeting of some kind. By the turn of the century, now we have the name A.B. Coleman here. This is going to be different because Mr. Coleman is not going to be, it doesn't live there. He owns the farm, but he lives in Titusville. And he's actually going to rent out the farm, uh, you know, as a as a monetary and economic benefit to himself, uh, whereas he's he's not going to going to live there. Uh, we also see a man named Ben Wilson living in the blacksmith house. The blacksmith shop is basically closed down at this time. Ben Wilson is a was a black man who, with his wife, uh, retired from farming and came to that two acre lot uh, that um, Lewis Phillips had, had started 
and lived there for uh, just about 10 years until he, he died. So again, it's just the, the end of the blacksmith era and you know, the, just the economics of the whole area are changing. The schoolhouse, you can see on the A1903 map, has, has moved. And beyond that, the, the J. Ely there, that's the second Phillips house. It still exists at this point. But again, um, you know, the mill, the blacksmith shop, all of these things are changing. And it's becoming uh, very rural. And certainly no uh, community center has developed at that intersection. Having said that, though, the schoolhouse does serve as a community center. There's just not enough, there's not a lot of economic activity that develops there also. In the 20th century, uh, we take over from Charles Miller, who owned the farm for about 40 years, and we mentioned A.B. Coleman, who purchased it about 1900 and is going to own it till about 1913, again, just leasing the farm to other people. And there's going to be about uh, five different families that are going to live during this 13-year period at the farm. While that's going on, uh, in 1917, the schoolhouse gets expanded to a two-room schoolhouse. And this, you know, is a, a bright sign in a way because Hopewell Township was trying to close down rural schools. And instead of closing down this one, they actually expanded it. And it's going to uh, continue to exist for about 19 more years uh, instead of being closed down. Uh, one reason it expanded is because they brought some students from Amwell Township down when their school was being uh, torn down and rebuilt. And it took a couple of years. And so they brought the students down, down here. Starting about 1913, we have a new owner though, the Lemming family, who had who had been the, the last renters under Coleman. And they are going to have the farm until about 1920. The Lemming family um, also historically, notice that 1920 is right after the Spanish flu epidemic of 1919. And that's not a coincidence. The, the Lemmy family suffered very badly uh, with the Spanish flu and wound up selling their farm. And it was sold to the Cromwell family. And the Cromwell family had been renting that um, second Phillips house that we've talked about. Uh, they'd been renting it for almost between 10 and 20 years. And now they're going to just move uh, to the, uh, what's today, the house farm. So they move into the Howell farmhouse and they're going to live there for uh, 20, 20 years or so. One of the first things they're going to do is um, keep changing the farm over to a dairy farm that had started uh, with the lemmings and they need more cow space. So they're going to fill in the area uh, between the um, initial L sections of the 1840s barn to create more space. They also are going to set up their own creamery and their own milk service. So Xenophon Cromwell had his delivery truck and you see here him in front of the barn. And you can see this was before he filled in that gap back there. You can see the roof line um, hasn't been filled in yet. Now, while all this is going on, the school closes in 1936, and the children are gonna now be bused to Titusville or to the Harberton School, depending on which part of Pleasant Valley they live in. So the school is not gonna be there anymore. This also is going to kind of remove that community center uh, that everybody uh, looked to to gel the Pleasant Valley community together. Now, in 1938, two years after that school closes, uh, we're gonna see some things happen uh, to the, 
I should have done this in a different order here. Whoops. Um, we're going to see the uh, barn enlarge more. Uh, the Cromwells needed even more room for cows, so they're going to add that section you see on the left. That again is a structure moved to the barn. That's why it's not the same width, and they had to build that uh, little uh, addition, that one-story addition to even out the, the width of the barn. And they also built a creamery uh, where they did their milking and things like that at the, the other end of the barn. So they also are going to put in silos at one point. So you can see that this is, is really moving towards a uh, very good dairy farm. At the same time, the wooden poultry farm starts where the schoolhouse was. Uh, Mr. Wooden, first of all, uh, takes part of the schoolhouse or down where the porch is, used to be the front room of the schoolhouse and it extended out even further than that. And you can see the chicken houses behind it. Uh, that schoolhouse section that he took down still exists, but it's scattered all over his farm because he built other structures out of it and just took the one room of the schoolhouse, the room that had been built in 1917, and converted that into his family home. And so you see here, um, about 1950, what the farmhouse made out of the schoolhouse looked like, and then all the poultry buildings that he built. And again, many of those windows come from the old schoolhouse. The poultry buildings have, um, what I would say, desks and um, book ca bookcases, cabinets, things like that that came out of the schoolhouse. Um, he, he used everything. He, he recycled that first part of the schoolhouse into his, his poultry stuff. And now we get to the last owners, the uh, Sidem family uh, up until 1962, and then the Howells who own the farm but lease it out to other farmers until 1974 when uh, Mrs. Howell donates the farm to Mercer County in honor of her husband who had passed away. And in her uh, letter to the county uh, offering the farm as a gift, she indicated exactly what she wanted the county to do with the property. She wanted them to keep it as a farm, to continue its 250 year history, if you will, and to make it possible for people to actually do things there, not just see things there, and especially children. And if, if you can just read a little bit of her letter, uh, even just a, a couple of snippets, you can see that she just had this vision of a, of a living farm, not just living history, but living now, uh, that people would be able to experience uh, rural life and life on a farm that was just uh, passing everybody's existence when uh, she donated the farm in, in the 1970s. And as a volunteer at the farm, I can tell you that an awful lot of people come to the farm who have no idea what farm life was like uh, before you know, modern times. And when so few people are farmers today and farms are so large and mechanized uh, rather than the family farm, which how a farm represents. So Howl Farm today uh, on this map shows uh, all of those buildings that exist and the sites of buildings that used to exist. You know, that what's the, this time capsule of agricultural history that we have at the farm. And also I've shown you know, where the visitor center is that was added in, in, in 2003 and then the barn on it in 2005. Uh, so that when you come to the visitor center, you then go from the visitor center to a family farm. And you feel like you're on that family farm and everything is on the, the scale of a working farm. And again, back to that little map that I, I used earlier that shows the crop uh, areas. You can see that the, the farm does um, 
raise crops on, on a good portion of, of the land. No farm is 100% because it's got creeks, it's got woods, it's got stony areas, it's got places that uh, just don't work for crops, but uh, how farms used everything that, that can happen. And so visitors can see all of those areas as they go through the agricultural year and how things change from year to year even. So how a farm is not one of those places you visit once and you get the, the full picture. You almost have to go back many times in order to see the potential of uh, how farming extended over a year, not just day after day the same. So the farm today is uh, accessible to the public and also does a lot of programming as a living history farm meaning that it's not just uh, objects to look at, it's processes to see, it's animals to see, and it's an opportunity to get hands-on with things. Whether it be pain in a couple of different fashions, and on the right-hand side we show threshing of the wheat. By the way, that will be a big part of the program on Saturday at the 4-H fair, we'll be threshing wheat there, very similar to what you see in that picture. And because it's a living history farm, there are costumed interpreters and staff representing that turn of the 20th century period. The equipment that uh, the farm uses, the animals on the farm, the techniques that are used are all representative of that time period. Although every once in a while, we will get out of that time period as you see in the lower, uh, excuse me, in the right-hand picture there, which is um, a much earlier picture, a much earlier time period. Uh, but we, at the farm, preserve and teach a lot of skills that uh, simply aren't used too much today and most people don't know about. But uh, people have an opportunity to uh, know, know what it was to be a farmer in many ways. And we also had the farm and through its history as, as a uh, property of, of the county system has had an internship program where people come to really learn about animal powered farming, whether it be oxen or horses, uh, or whether they um, you know, are going to go into the Peace Corps or whether they work in a, uh, another country where animal power is used and they wanna come and learn uh, more about it at, the, at Howell Farm, uh, whether they're going to work at a living history museum and they, they want to learn, uh, you know, the, the way that Howell Farm does it. Uh, it's just a number of, of avenues that people get long-term teaching. Not, it's not just a day's visit. It, it might be several months. It might be a year or more. But it's, the farm today is is very much geared towards participation by visitors whenever possible. Now, being a farm and working with horses and things like that, it isn't always possible to uh, have the public uh, assist. Sometimes it just gets a little too dangerous or whatever. But we do try to make it as frequently as possible uh, that people get a hands-on experience, as you see from some of these examples. And one of the really fun ones is ice harvest, when we get ice uh, in the winter time. And a lot of people enjoy that, particularly as we fill up the ice house uh, with 20 some tons of ice each year that lasts all year. If you can see in the background, uh, just to the left of the ice house, you can see a horse. And sometimes people pull the ice up, sometimes we use a horse to pull the rope to get the big blocks of ice up into the into the ice house. And of course, when the crops are harvested, people uh, enjoy getting out there and, and participating with that also. So today, the farm has a lot of school programs during the week when schools have field trips that they can come out to do uh, with kids of various ages. Certainly the Saturday programs that cater to families are different every weekend and follow the, the farm uh, year. And also some uh, community skills as well as farming, if you notice the fiddle contest, for example, the 4-H the fair, things like that. 
Uh, there's also programs for kids, the hatchery and the farm hands program, which this year is is not doing much because of COVID, but you know has been a, a program and will be again. And also summer day camp. Um, and again, you know that may or may not happen this year, but it's it's something that the farm will will do at some point. The farm also reaches out to the community. Farming in general was a community thing. Farmers helped each other. And so the farm wants to continue that aspect of, of rural life, of, of helping. And one of the early uh, community outreach efforts was all the potatoes that were grown on the farm uh, were either used at the farm uh, for demonstrations, that kind of thing, cooking, but also the vast majority given to the Trenton area soup kitchens. And initially it was former Peace Corps volunteers who helped with this program. Uh, but we've always given, you know, tons of potatoes to um, the soup kitchen. Now, continuing that and expanding on that, uh, we have this year's the Share the Harvest program, which has included sharing a lot of other crops besides the potatoes. And in addition, uh, we continue to help uh, the city, city of Trenton uh, through the Chestnut Street Community Garden uh, sponsored by Isles, where we bring in either an ox team or a horse team with plow, and we plow that community garden for the people and children from the nearby schools uh, come and they actually get to plow and walk behind the animal as you see them doing, particularly in the, in the center picture. And most recently, uh, the Capital City Farm, which is uh, right next to the uh, Trenton area soup kitchen, is uh, uh, a city farm, uh, an urban farm, uh, that's helping to bring the community near it and Trenton together also. And again, get this idea of community help that has been so much a part of the, the farming experience. So the farm is continually reaching out and attempting to, to help people. And that's basically the story that I wanted to tell you tonight. Um, the farm is, again, not a static thing that you can go visit once and you get a pre-processed program. It's something that is different every day. Uh, it, flows with the development of the farming season uh, with nature. And it also is a place where uh, the past is preserved, both above and below ground, where skills are preserved, and where people are taught about um, a variety, of, a wide variety of history, but focused on that time period around the turn of the 20th century. So thank you. Thank you so much for such an informative talk. And I do do just want to um, kind of second what you had said. I mean, having young kids and taking them to the farm. And I do love how it follows the farm season. And it's always a new experience when we go. Um, they think it's gonna be the same thing, but it, it could be March. There's something completely different going on <laughs> with the farm season. Um, so it really is, and I can't help but wonder how Mrs. Howell would feel about um, just everything that the farm is doing and how it has uh, achieved those goals that she was looking for and it's gone beyond with the outreach. So I just think it is such a, a wonderful endeavor and I feel very fortunate that we have that um, in Mercer County. So thank you, Larry, for such a great conversation and a great talk. Um, I do have a couple questions that have come through. Okay. Um, through our chat here. And if you do have questions, please feel free to use the chat. As Amelia pointed out in the beginning, there should be a little speech bubble that is on your computer and you can click on that and access the chat to type out any questions you have for us. Um, well, actually for our presenter, because I'm not gonna know. Um, so the, one of the things, and this was, I really did love your use of the maps and how you could see the differences going from year to year or decade to decade or, and, Someone asked, um, can the abrupt disappearance of structures be attributed to loss by fire 
or dismantlement um, and our movement to another area for repurpose? And how can you determine if that's possible? If it's po or is it possible to determine what happened to those structures? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, very often, if if they uh, uh, fell subject to fire, the archaeology will reveal that there will be, you know, burned material, ash, things like that. There'll be evidence. Uh, we don't find that, you know, with any of these. On the other hand, we do know from um, word of mouth that comes down through the ages that several of the structures like the grist mill for example were recycled and that some of the timbers and things were used in for repairing barns nearby and things like that so just like the uh, the creation of the wooden the poultry farm from the farmhouse is an example of uh, rededicating material uh, you get a lot of that in in the other structures also and that was that was how many stories was it? Three stories. The the chicken, uh, the poultry barn was three stories. Is that right, or was it two? One one of them is three stories. Yeah, one yeah. of them is one of them is one, and one of them has a kind of a two story section on one end of it. Yeah. But that's neat that he used the schoolhouse materials um, when he was doing the, one of the chicken, uh, the poultry. Yeah, he obviously used other things too because he didn't yeah. have enough. You know, yeah, just, right. But it started out with it started out with the schoolhouse stuff. Yeah. Um, so I have another uh, participant who asked when and when and why did the town? I, I don't. Well, you might you might know this. When and why did the town name change to Lambertville? <laughs> I don't know. I assume that there was a family <laughs> named Lambert <laughs> right. who became very prominent and said, maybe we'll call this Lambertville. <laughs> I, that, that's kind of what happens. I don't know that for sure. That's just a, an educated guess. And I certainly don't know when it was. Okay, thank you. And just there's lots of thank yous coming through. Um, thank you for the how informative it was. Uh, I have parents that are saying um, their kids practically grew up there. Uh, so that's something that I want to make sure to share with you, as well as the Mercer County Park Commission. Um, so just if anyone else has any other questions, please feel free to type them in. And we'll just give it a couple more seconds because I know typing, not all of us took typing in high school. <laughs> Some of us still hunt and peck. <laughs> and I think that's it. And I do want to thank um, you again for the presentation. Um, I really do appreciate it. And it was very informative. And uh, I look at the farm in a whole new way every time. And just this presentation gives me a whole new outlook on it as well. And I do want to thank Amelia from the IT department for helping uh, with the program this evening, especially as the weather was so crazy. So thank you to everyone. And um, we will be seeing you soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody, and thank you.